In this video, we will try and understand why Afghan forces did not fight the Taliban. We'll go in detail and I'll try to explain this whole scenario with simple illustrations. Afghanistan's armed forces were trained by the Americans, NATO forces, even India has trained them. They have also received billions of dollars in military assistance from the United States. As far as capability is concerned, more than 3 lakh Afghan army is very much capable of at least fighting. I'm not saying winning. If the Afghan forces wanted, they could have fought against the Taliban for a reasonable period of time. But that did not happen. See, you have to understand this. Any country's reign of power has to be either in the hands of elected politicians or in the hands of the army. In the case of Afghanistan, the democratic government collapsed. Ashraf Ghani ran away and took asylum in UAE. That means after the government, the Afghan forces which includes the army, police and other security forces, as per the constitution, the Afghan army should have taken the reign of power in their hands. Even that did not happen. Ideally, it is expected that any country's armed forces will deliver, if at all the government fails. In Afghanistan's case, more than 3 lakh Afghan soldiers were supposed to fight for their motherland. After all, they were all trained, they were well equipped, and they also have various institutions that have the motivation, resources to hold the discipline and morality of their forces to uphold Afghan's constitution and its democratic values. But then what we saw is that, irrespective of what kind of weapons they had and their training levels, the Afghan forces did not fire a single bullet. They did not fight the Taliban. And the reason why that happened is because the Afghan forces had many fault lines within. In this video, I'm going to explain those fault lines there were many gaps in the Afghan armed forces. The first point is, there were huge communication gaps between the officers level and regular soldiers. Soldiers have ethnic loyalties to their tribes, more than the nation. Cronyism is something that is very common in the Afghan forces. Many of these soldiers were referred by their fellow soldiers. People were joining the Afghan forces based on references and not proper qualification. As a result, soldiers had no sense of nationalism. They were only loyal to their tribes. Afghanistan is a country of many tribes. Alliances shift, people, families and tribes make rational calculations based on the risk they face. So, many soldiers acted in their self-interest. In Hindi, we say, Wo jazba nahi tha desh ke prati. Desh bhakti nahi thi. Bas loyalty thi apne kabile ya kaum ki taraf. In Afghanistan, you will find Pashtuns to be large in number. They are not a majority, but they are large in number. They must be around 40 to 43 percent of the Afghan population. Again, these numbers are not exact, but you know, enough resources suggest that they are somewhere around 40 to 43 percent. But then you will hear the Pashtuns saying that they are majority, but that is not true. They say it purely for political reasons. The Afghan government has always lied about its population census, because then they will not get any aid from the United Nations. So there is all sorts of politics being played with respect to their ethnic population. There was no birth or death certificates in Afghanistan till 2001. I think only after 2001 it started. That to the Americans insisted. So there is no factual proof of Afghan population. The Afghan government used to say something, the American had their own numbers, United Nations had their own count, then local NGOs have their own count. So there is no proper population census. No one knows exactly how much the Afghan population is. Anyhow, Pashtuns are large in number, but not a majority. An interesting thing about Pashtun is that there are more Pashtuns in Pakistan than in Afghanistan. And they cross border frequently. That is why you will also hear Pashtuns talk about independent state, which stretches till the Indus River in Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province in Pakistan. When the Soviet Afghan war came to an end in 1989, Pakistan wanted to control the political landscape of Afghanistan. Pakistan trained a large number of students from the Pashtun areas of eastern and southern Afghanistan to fight in the Soviet-Afghan war as Mujahideen fighters. They had been educated in traditional Islamic schools. After the end of Soviet-Afghan war, that is in early 90s, these Mujahid fighters formed the Taliban under the guidance and authority of Pakistani army and ISI. That is why you will find Taliban follows Deibandi Islam. In India, there is a place called Deiband. I want you to find out where it is. Their ideology is the same. So Pashtuns in Afghanistan have historically been the ruling class people. You can read about the Durrani Empire. Ahmad Shah Durrani brought different Pashtun tribes together and created the Durrani Empire. So even today, they have the sense of being a superior ethnic group in Afghanistan. Anyhow, after Pashtuns, you have Tajiks. Tajiks speak Persian. They are probably around 35%. 
They are also Sunni Muslim like Pashtuns. And by the way, exceptions also exist. You will also find Shia Pashtun and Shia Tajik in Afghanistan. Keep that in mind. Now if you see, the Persian speaking people have run the government of Afghanistan for a long time. Because when the British went to Afghanistan from India in 1839, they officialized the Persian language. Because from Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, all the way to the Mughals in India kept Persian language as the main speaking language for centuries. So even the British kept Farsi language as the main language of Afghanistan. That means the educated people in Afghanistan spoke Persian language. And obviously the educated people would form the Afghan government. Now over time, even Pashtuns who came to cities, they started speaking Persian language so that they can join the government. So ethnically people remained Pashtuns, but culturally they became Persianized. That is why the Pashtuns you see in Fata region of Pakistan and Pashtuns living in Kabul, they are culturally different, although they are from the same ethnic group. So Tajiks are ethnically Persian speaking people. They make up the business class, clerics, and they also make up the large agricultural class. After that comes the Uzbeks or Turks. They are Turkish speaking people. Their numbers are somewhere around 9 to 10%. They produce the carpets of Afghanistan. Major export of Afghanistan is carpets. Remember that and Turks produce them. Now if you see Tajiks, Uzbeks and Turks, they have relations on the other side of the border that is in Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan and Tajikistan. But their culture is different because 70 years of Soviet rule has transformed those Central Asian societies. They are a bit more liberal and modern when compared to the ones in Afghanistan. The Afghan side of Tajiks, Uzbeks and Turks think that the Central Asian countries are not strong people. How did they let the Soviets rule? So that kind of feeling still exists. So here we learn that the ethnicity is similar but the culture is very different. But when it comes to Pashtun ethnicity, Pashtuns in Afghanistan and Pakistan have similar culture and lifestyle. The only difference exists between Persian speaking Pashtuns living in main cities of Afghanistan and Pashto speaking Pashtuns living in south deserts, caves and Fata areas. But then they have almost similar culture, just a difference of traditionalism and modernism, that's it. So if you see the case of Tajiks, Uzbeks and Turks, their ethnicity is similar but their culture is different when you compare it with Central Asian countries. But that is not the case with Pashtuns. Pashtuns in Pakistan and Afghanistan have similar ethnicity and also similar culture. The only difference is that some modern Pashtuns who live in cities of both Pakistan and Afghanistan have evolved. However, the majority of Pashtuns living in Afghanistan and Pakistan are strong traditionalists. And then there are Hazaras. They are also 10%. These are Shia Afghans who live around the central region of Afghanistan, where the Bamiyan Buddhas lived. Hazaras are said to be the descendants of Genghis Khan, the founder of the Mongol Empire. They have been traditionally discriminated by the Sunni Muslims as well as the Pashtuns. And obviously in the 21st century, their group has also got somewhat equality in politics and other national interests. So naturally, they won't let that go away easily. Now coming to Taliban, they are mostly composed of Pashtuns. And if you are aware of the Taliban's ideology, they are traditionalists. That means they also speak Pashto. So the Pashtuns who formed the government, they spoke Dari, which is Persian, Farsi. Obviously, Taliban is not in support of that. During their rule between 1996 and 2001, the Taliban forced Pashto language on non-Pashto speakers, rewriting textbooks and signs. That means within Pashtuns, those Persian-speaking Pashtuns are not very much liked by the Talibanis. Both Karzai and Ashraf Ghani were Pashtuns, but they spoke Persian. And 77% in Afghanistan speak Dari, Persian, and remaining speak Pashto. So you have to understand this division with the Pashtuns. Similar ethnicity but different culture and language scenario. Now I want you to pay attention. If I say Hazaras are Shia Afghans, automatically you will think that they are anti-Taliban and they will never support Taliban. It is not that simple. You will find a Hazara leader who has also joined hands with the Taliban. Why? Because every ethnic group wants representation. Similarly, the opposite is also true. Taliban will also reach out to Hazaras so that they can have contacts with the Iranians. After all, Iran is a Shia majority country. So these kind of dealings also exist. Similarly, within Taliban, there are certain subgroups who can switch sides whenever they feel that their needs are not being met. For example, look at Ashraf Khani. He belongs to the Ahmadzai Pashtun tribe. Look at Hamid Karzai. He belongs to the Pobalzai Pashtun tribe. So like this, there are around 60 tribes within Pashtun ethnic group. And then there is also a federation of these tribes. The main ones are the Durani from south of Kabul and the Ghilji who are from east of Kabul. 
Durrani and Gilgia federations and then there are 60 sub tribes in Pashtun ethnic group. You see there is a lot of division. So this ethnic division of Pashtun, Tajik, Uzbek, Hazara is meant for people like us who are outsiders. But if you are in Pakistan, it doesn't work that way. Their leaders have links and they switch alliances from time to time. Within Pashtun for example, a Pashtun at a national level will call himself a proud Pashtun. But then you will see on ground that a Pashtun may not be able to stand another Pashtun from a different tribe who lives in a different valley even if they are closely related or they are married in each other's tribe. And by the way Pashtuns practice a lot of cousin marriage. And if you see that also exist in Pakistan as well as in India. So all these groups are ethnic groups. Within them there are tribes. Since there has been no strong central government ever in Afghanistan, that means there was no central ethnic identity imposed on the Afghans. For example in Pakistan they have made Punjabis, Sindhis, Pashtuns, Baloch speak Urdu. They have imposed it. This kind of thing does not exist in Afghanistan because there was never a strong central government. The only two languages that is majorly spoken are Dari or Farsi and then Pashto. And then there are many regional languages. So it is easy to categorize ethnic groups but the moment you go deep inside a tribal level that is where complexity begins. You cannot pinpoint and figure out how and when the intermix happened. If you have studied anthropology you will understand what I am saying. So Pashtuns in Pakistan and Afghanistan have similar ethnicity as well as culture. The only minor difference is with respect to some Pashtuns who live in cities of Pakistan and Afghanistan. They are a bit modern. But then majority of the Pashtuns of both Afghanistan and Pakistan are traditionalists. The reason I'm calling them Afghan and Pakistan Pashtun is because of the political boundary. But if you see it from a Pashtuns point of view, they don't really recognize the Duran line. But anyhow within Pashtuns there are different tribes who run businesses and trades like a mafia. And this works cross border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. That is how the ethnically and culturally Pashtuns have maintained close ties in both the countries. But if you look at the other ethnic groups like Tajik, Uzbek, Hazara, Turkmeni, they don't have any cultural links with people from other side of the border. As I've said, they may be ethnically same. But their culture is totally different. Due to 70 years of Soviet communism, Central Asian countries have changed a lot. But that is not the case with Pashtuns. And it is because of these Pashtun population, Pakistan has been able to maintain a lot of influence in Afghanistan since the Soviet Afghan war. Pakistani establishment has maintained close links with the tribal federations like the Duranis and Ghiljis. If you look at Taliban, it was a movement started by the Pakistani army and ISI. Talib means religious students. Pakistan took religious students from the Pashtun areas of eastern and southern Afghanistan who were educated in traditional Islamic schools which are called Madarsas in Pakistan. It all started at the end of Soviet Afghan war in 1989. Along with Pakistan many Gulf countries have also funded the Taliban movement. But primarily Pakistan was the middleman or you can say broker. Taliban is the creation of Mullah Omar and Mullah Baradar along with the support of Pakistani army and ISI. And within these Pashtuns there are many warlords representing different tribal groups. With time they all have come together and formed an alliance and that is how Taliban gained more and more power. And as I've said moments back, you shouldn't be surprised if you find out that some leader of a different ethnic group also supports the Taliban. Because everyone needs representation. In other words, everyone needs their share of the pizza. When so many Pashtuns cross border from Afghanistan to Pakistan, you cannot say who is a Talibani or a member of Al-Qaeda or Islamic State Khorasan. It is not written on their heads, right? So this way Pakistan has been able to maintain influence in Afghanistan since the Soviet Afghan war. Along with them Gulf countries are also involved, no doubt in that. Now coming to the Afghan forces, it consists largely of Pashtun people. There are people of other ethnic groups too, but Pashtuns are large in number. And I've also mentioned how people join the Afghan forces based on reference, which is called cronyism. This way most of the Pashtuns who joined the Afghan forces, they had no sense of nationalism. Instead they have strong tribal sympathy. Even a lot of high ranking officers even though they were corrupt, but many of them also have tribal affinity. And then there were also soldiers who were part of both the Afghan forces as well as Taliban sympathizers. That is how information got leaked. How do you think Taliban is able to gain control of military bases and outposts? Obviously they were insiders who passed information. So overall if you see the Afghan forces folded due to all these factors. And then finally when United States made peace deal with the Taliban, because they were aware of these tribal unities, 
On the other hand, America had provided billions of dollars of weapons training to the Afghan forces and the government. United States couldn't see any return on its 20 years investment. That is when America decided to switch side and sign a peace deal with the Taliban. So America did not lose, it simply changed its betting horse. And that was the final signal to the Afghan government as well as the Afghan forces that their time is up now. In simple words, if I have to explain, your boss hires you for a job and he carefully monitors you for a year and you're not delivering, your boss will start looking for alternative. That is the same scenario. All these ground soldiers who had strong tribal links, why would they fight their own people? So even they quit and gave up. Many of them ran away to Panjshir and joined the Northern Alliance. I'm sure they must be non-Pashtuns or maybe those Pashtun who are not in favor of the Taliban regime. But then most of the Afghan forces did not fight the Taliban. They did not fire a single bullet because backdoor negotiations already happened. All the warlords and tribal leader, they all had backdoor negotiations and came in support of the Taliban. And that is why when Taliban gained control on 15th August, Pakistan celebrated because there are more Pashtuns in Pakistan than in Afghanistan. So Pakistan thought Pashtuns are Sunni Muslims and Pakistani Punjabi ruling class is also Sunni Muslim. And their interior minister has said it on record that Pakistan has taken care of the Taliban for years. Like that, Pakistan strongly feels that it can now run the show in Afghanistan. Of course, Gulf countries are also involved. Why do you think the peace deal happened in Doha? But you also have to understand that today's Taliban is not the same 1994 Taliban because Taliban is aware of Pakistan's double standards. If you recollect, Taliban's co-founder Mullah Baradar was imprisoned in Pakistani jail for almost seven years. Obviously, Pakistan has taken money from United States. Do you think Taliban and CIA is not aware of it? They are. So Taliban is very well aware of Pakistan's double-crossing nature. Anyhow, so it was all pre-planned and all sorts of negotiations happened between the Taliban and the warlords and tribal chiefs. So there was no sense of nationalism in the Afghan forces. It was all tribal and ethnic loyalty. Apart from this, within the Afghan armed forces, there were deep problems. When I say problems, I mean corruption, lack of education, illiteracy, drugs and of course leadership. For example, to maintain any army, you need continuous logistical supply, service and repair of equipment, maintenance of weapons of both land and air defense systems like rifles, artillery, tanks, missiles, planes, etc. and many more such things. There was no system. These things were not maintained. Lack of education led to basic problems such as maintaining equipment from rifles to vehicles to ordering spare parts. And not knowing how to write meant that Afghan officers couldn't even read the maps properly. Many couldn't even count properly. And then comes the problem of drugs. Many soldiers were high on Afim and Hashish. As I've said, within the Pashtun ethnicity, there are multiple tribes. These tribes have specialities. For example, someone runs dry fruit business, meat business, agriculture and other kinds of businesses and trade. Similarly, there are tribes that specialize in supplying drugs like Afim and Hashish. Then weapons like Kalashnikov rocket launchers. If you remember, how did the narcotics and gun culture spread in Pakistan? It was created by the Pashtuns after the Soviet-Afghan war. So over the time, there are Pashtun tribes who have gained expertise in these things. When people from these tribes join the Afghan forces, drugs get easily available within the forces. As I've said, soldiers have strong tribal affinity. Have you noticed when Taliban gained control of Afghanistan, they did not directly go to Kabul. They started acquiring rural areas first. These are the core areas of Taliban influence. Here the Taliban was able to gain influence because the Afghan soldiers who were posted in these regions, due to their strong tribal affinity, they couldn't shoot even a single bullet at Taliban. Because at back end, their tribal chief has shaken hands with the Taliban. Plus, if you see all these areas along the borders of Pakistan, that's how cross-border trade as well as smuggling happens. So everything was pre-decided. And then finally, when Americans signed the peace deal with Taliban, it had a psychological effect on the Afghan forces. And that was the final nail in the coffin that led to the folding of the Afghan forces. That is why large portion of the Afghan armed forces gave up and fled. So all these factors led to the folding of the Afghan forces. By the way, these are also the tribal and ethnic dynamics of Afghanistan. So it is almost impossible to stabilize Afghanistan. These tribal dynamics shift with time and based on interests. For example, tomorrow, let's say XYZ tribe, if they don't like the Taliban because their interests are not being met, that tribe will shift its alliance and they may join Tehrik-e Taliban, Daesh, Haqqani Network, Quetta Shura, Al-Qaeda or Islamic State Khorasan. 
It is similar to what we see in civilized world. Suppose you work for Microsoft. Tomorrow, if you're not happy, you can join Google, Facebook, etc. That is the same way these tribes in Afghanistan function. Couple of days back, there was a clash between the Taliban and Haqqanis. Why do you think it happened? They both are allies, right? This is called power struggle. The Haqqani leader shot the Taliban leader Mullah Brother over some disagreements. After all, everyone wants key positions in the new Taliban government, right? That is the thing. So what we learned from this is that, at the core, all these terror militant groups are like wolves. They will fight among themselves too, but at the core, they all are wolves. Based on interests, different tribes will support a particular wolf. That is why it is almost impossible to stabilize Afghanistan. Because you cannot keep everyone happy, and their alliances shift quite often. And the Americans have understood this. That is why they have repositioned by leaving Afghanistan. I hope you found this video informative. Thank you for watching it.